Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Woo! Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up, join us for worship. Come on, let's put our hands together.
Jesus. So we just love your presence. We love your name. There's no other name but yours, Jesus. Shakes the mountain tops. The only word that breaks the curse is all. Your name, the one that covers all. It's higher than the others. It's higher than the others. It's name that shakes the mountain. The only word that breaks the curse is all. Your name, the one that covers all. It's higher than the others. It's higher than the others. For the faith and wonder of a sin.
much, Lord, you are so faithful. That song said, there is power in the name of Jesus, right? And this is who we get to serve. So whether your life looks chaotic and crazy, Jesus is calm. The name of Jesus is everything that you would ever need. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He is the calm in the storm. He is the steadiness to the craziness, and that's who he is. And so many times, whether it's a political season, whether it's something personal, whether it's something you're looking at the world and you're just like, Jesus, what is going on? I don't even know what's happening. But what we do know is he is the one that calms the storms. He is the one that calms the seas just by a word. And this is who we get to worship. And the next song that we're going to sing says, it's basically like, if it's not you, Jesus, I don't want it. And so many times when we can sing this song and we think about a thing that we want or a person that we want or a job that we want, like if it's not you, Lord, I don't want it. But I want us to go into this next song and think, Jesus, if it's not you, just you, you and of yourself, I don't want it. Like, I just want you. You are steady. You are calm. You are good. You are my Lord. So I want us to go, and we're going to raise our hands, and I want us just to say, Jesus, I just want you. Jesus, we love your presence in this place. There is nothing else that we want. So Lord, we just say, if you're not in it, we don't want it, God. We only want you. Take the lead of every step I make. Even if you tell my feet to wait. Because where you are is where I want to be. The death
just want you to sing it again. I don't want it if you're not in it. I just want you. No, I don't want it if you're not in it. I just want you. See, I don't want it if you're not. Troy. God has created us uniquely different. Shapes and personalities so exclusive to one's being. And we are called to fit our shapes in with others to fellowship together, to create together, to systematically and poetically change the world as one community. Today, Amen. I believe God's got a word. Before we jump into the message, though, it is a special Sunday. Um, we are going to be, it's Child Dedication Sunday. Uh, we do these a couple times a year. As you know, uh, the Lord said, uh, be fruitful and multiply. And uh, there's some people who are fruitful and multiplied. And so uh, what we want to do today is we want to basically dedicate these children to the Lord. And what that simply means is that these two specifically today are charging before God and before all of us that uh, they're going to raise their child 
in a godly home and are endeavoring to raise them in a godly community. And this is a team sport, y'all. I don't know if you've ever had kids. It's a team sport. All right. I don't know if you should come up here on a Sunday. I'll show you how much of a team sport it is to have kids. No, like on like on a like a setup on Sunday uh, before or after. I know, but you know what I mean. Um, but come up here and I'll let you I'll let you watch my kids. And so because um, that's pretty much what happens. They're like, where's where's your father? I don't know. I don't know where he's at. Um, but it's a team sport. And we are endeavoring to say with them that we're going to help raise them in a godly community. So um, could Kaisen and Emiliano bring your parents up here? Here we go. Look, I'm going to let you guys have the limelight. Two cuties. You can just stand right here in the middle. Come on, look at the beauties. Look at the beauties. Hi. So I'm going to read a couple scriptures before we kind of go into this moment. Uh, if you've got a Bible, you can turn. I got an iPad, so I get to cheat. First um, Samuel 1 28. Uh, these are, there's two scriptures specifically I want to read because I believe they really set the tone for what we're, what we're endeavoring here to do. First Samuel 1 28 says, I now give the boy to the Lord for as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. And then it says, then he worshiped the Lord there. What that simply is saying is that the mother of Samuel was dedicating the prophet to the Lord. And she says, he's his. And that's what we're saying today. Uh, there's a reason why the Lord calls us parents, right? The, the rent part on the end of it is true. We're just renting them. And we're going to give them back to God. Amen? And then the, the other scriptures, Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up in a child in the way he or she should go. And when they get old, they will not depart from it. Now, some parents in here understand this because you got older kids. It said they won't depart from it. It didn't say that at no point they won't depart from it. They won't stray completely away. They will come back. So, um, church, what we're going to do is we're going to pray over each of these little ones and their mamas. And uh, we're going to dedicate them to the Lord. And when we're doing that, I just simply ask that you would stretch out your hands and uh, pray with us as we pray over the little ones here. This is Kyson. We're going to go Kyson first because he's staring at me. Can I hold him? Is that okay? All right. Come here, big guy. That's okay. I don't care. Uh, can you say hi? Say bye. Yeah. Nice little slobber. You're so cute. All right. If you guys could stretch your hands towards. Oh, you're going to hold it for me? Thank you. <laughs> Yummy. Well, Father, we lift up Kyson and Amber to you, Lord, and we just ask that you would watch over both of them. God, we give Kyson to you, and we just ask that you would protect him in all of his days and that you would guide him in all of his ways, and that, Lord, he would grow up strong knowing you. And, Lord, we just thank you for this moment and thank you for the call of God that is on Kyson's life. Lord, we dedicate him to you and to the service of your kingdom. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have any parting words? No. Thank you. And what we do have for each of these parents is we have a certificate to commemorate the moment. And then we also have uh, my first Bible stories so you can read. I know that's, I, I bought it for the pictures. That's what I bought it for. So to commemorate the moment, can we give her a hand clap and Kaisen a hand clap? Oh, now you're going to talk. And then this is Emiliano. He's my best friend. Come here, big guy. Can you, sh can you show him your outfit? Look how cute you are. <gasps> you want to say something? You want to say something? Are you going to eat the microphone too? Can you give him a go Chiefs? Or are you going to eat it? How about, uh, how about the Raiders aren't good? How about that? No? Don't lick it. <laughs> what are you doing? If you guys could stretch your hands out. Oh, yeah, you're going to eat that thing, aren't you? 
Well, Father, we lift up Emiliano to you, and we just ask, God, that you would watch over him, protect him all of his days, and guide all of his ways. Lord, we thank you so much for the calling of God that is on his life. I thank you right now that you are going to reveal it as he gets older, what it is that you want him to do. And God, we just thank you so much for Jamie, and we just pray, Lord, that you would be with her and leading her by your Holy Spirit on how to raise him. And God, we just dedicate him to your service, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Yeah, you are trying so hard to lick that thing. Again, we have a certificate to commemorate, and uh, my first Bible stories here. Uh, Again, the book is beautiful. Church, let's pray real quick, and then we'll send them on their way, and we'll jump into the service. Lord, we thank you so much for each of these parents and the little ones. And God, we just thank you that as a church, we are saying that we're going to come alongside of them as a community, as a family, and we are going to help them raise these two little guys. That, Lord, they would grow up strong in knowing you. That, Lord, when they get older, they will not stray. They will not depart. They will not be moved, but they will have a strong foundation that is built upon you. And, God, we thank you right now for leading all of us by your Holy Spirit on how, that, how we could be there for each of these parents and all the parents in our community. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. And everybody said, amen. I need you to just air high five a couple people while we get situated here. Thank you. You guys can... Cute. Can we give them a hand clap? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm kind of biased. I think my kids were cute, but those are definitely, definitely cute. All right. How many of y'all got something out of last week? Okay, awesome, cool. <laughs> I'm glad I do all this for that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, week, week two of our series called Gather, um, we are going to be uh, advancing on this topic of community. And uh, I want to start by saying this. If you're new here, my name is Troy Bailey. I am the lead pastor of the Chapel KC. Uh, I'm honored that you're here. Uh, you could have went to any other great church here in Kansas City. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this, I promise. All right, cool. We did it. Um, You could have went to any other great church here in Kansas City, and there are a lot of them which chose to be here today. So I am definitely honored um, that you're here. And I think you picked a great, great week. Obviously, we got to see two cute babies. Isn't it uh, phenomenal when you can, like, love on babies and then just give them back? Yep. Right? Right? Does anyone want a four-year-old in here? Because I got one. Um, yeah, he is. Whew, gets it from his mama. Um, I'm just kidding. No, he gets, gets it from me. Uh, if you got a Bible, I want you to turn to Psalms 112 because I'm going to talk real quick about something that I think is very important to this house before I start preaching, which is we have our legacy offering coming up on Jan- or not January. Wow, way out ahead. November 22nd. Uh, This is simply our annual end-of-the-year giving. It is very important to us, uh, not because the money is important. It's because of what it symbolizes for our community. And uh, listen, a lot of people tithe. A lot of people give monthly. And this is above and beyond your normal tithe. This is a sacrificial offering. This is something where we're saying, God, uh, I I want to trust you. I want to obey you. And I want to bring the best gift that I can to this house so that we can continue to leave a legacy for Jesus in Kansas City. Amen? And uh, that that money is going to go towards a lot of different things, but mostly it's going to go towards continuing to spruce this place up, which is going to uh, go towards the bathrooms downstairs. And uh, how many of y'all know those need a a little little bit of love, right? Yeah. So uh, we're going to love on those. And listen, it's a legacy far beyond us because when we leave this place... It's going to be here for them, and it's going to be something their students will be able to use as well. How many of y'all are thankful for KCC? If you're not, you should be, because we might be having the service in my living room 
um, if if it wasn't for them and the, the partnership that we have with them. And we absolutely love this school. Uh, we love people like Stephen Kelso, who's a professor here and does their social media. And uh, absolutely, absolutely love this place. And so uh, November 22nd, this is what Psalms 112 verse 9 says, Never stingy, always generous to those in need. Their lives of influence and honor will never be forgot, forgotten. And they are full of good deeds. Woo, I'm about, about cough there. I know I just got over, uh, I don't know, allergies, I don't know, sore throat or whatever it was. Um, so I might take it a little easy, which means I probably won't. Uh, but it's talking about righteous people here, people who know God, who believe in God. These people are generous. They leave a legacy. They're full of good deeds. And I want that to be this house. Amen. And so every year we do this and we've seen God completely come through um, I'll just be honest with you. I'm believing God for $20,000. That's what I'm believing God for. And uh, that would be a little bit above what we got last year. And it will go a long way towards uh, what we have to do here at KCC and also what we can do in the community because not all that would go towards here. So that's what I'm believing God for. Um, but whether you can give $5, you can give 10 or you can give a dollar or 25 cents or you can give, you know, a grand, whatever it might be. Um, what we're asking, because we don't want anyone to give according to pressure, is that for the last three weeks and then the next three weeks, uh, continue to pray about what it is that God would want you to give. And just be obedient. Don't feel pressure, okay? Look at your neighbor. Say, no pressure. Uh -huh, you guys, that's the coolest you ever sounded. All right, here we go. Week two of Gather, we're going to jump in. How many y'all have a dinner table at home? You have a dinner table? You have an A table that's supposed to be where you sit down for dinner, but really it just collects mail and other things. Um, I'm glad any other people can relate. Um, our table looks nice. It just only gets used every now and again, mostly by my wife in the morning for her devotions. Um, she is the only one who uses it, but it's a simple design. Uh, tables are a simple design. Often it's where our most simple and fondest memories actually happen. It represents community, it represents family, it represents bonding. Uh, we, tend to openly, uh, we, we tend to open our dinner tables, I should say, in our home only to those we love and those that we want to do life with, right? How many of y'all have ever sat down and you said, who's the, most, who's the person I don't like the most? I'm going to invite them over for dinner. Yeah, not, not many. It's typically for the ones that we love and those that we want to share life with. As a Christian follower, as a Christ follower, I should say, as Christians, we have to understand this whole thing, this whole life that we live, that's been given to Jesus, is all about a table. It's all about a table. Not just any table, though. It is the kingdom of God's table. And you're like, Troy, you're speaking craziness. Follow me, Luke chapter 14. In verse 16, it says this, Then he... Jesus told them, a man has given a large banquet, invited many. I, I got to let you know, this is a parable. This is Jesus telling a story to illustrate a reality, whether it be a spiritual or a natural reality. That's what a parable is. And so in verse 17, it says, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell, or sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come because everything is now ready. Everyone say, it's ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask that you would excuse me. Seems legit, right? Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask that you excuse me. And another said, I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done and there's still room. Everyone say there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, 
Not one of these people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. Jesus is telling a story to illustrate a very, very, very important aspect of our Christianity. And that is evangelism. You're like, you mean to tell me that we're evangelicals? Yes. You mean when they talk about evangelicals on CNN and Fox News, they're talking about me? By label, yes. They're talking about people who evangelize, who tell others about Jesus. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Watch for the trap. <laughs> it's a trap. Watch for the trap. You're like, what do you mean? Just hold on. Buckle your seatbelts. The three excuses that were given in this parable were this. They were given as specimens of the rest. Answer to the care of this world. One was the answer to the care of this world. The other was deceitfulness of riches. And the other was the pleasures of this life. Luke 18, the person said, I got to care. I got to go take care of it to care of this world. Number two was in night, verse 19. It was this deceitfulness of riches. Remember, I just bought some oxen. I'm going to try them out. I got to make some money. I got to make, how many of y'all would agree making money is important, right? I like, I like my internet. I like my house. I like the vehicle I drive. Money is important. I, I can't have those if I don't have money. The other one is the pleasures of this life, Luke 14, 20 which ultimately in Matthew 13, 22 and Luke 8, 14 tell us that those are the things that choke out the word of God, the pleasures of this life. That person's like, yo, bro, I just got married. I got to enjoy it for a little bit, right? It's a, it's a care of this world, a pleasure of this world that was pulling that person away from the table that was set for them. And we have to watch this trap because we fall into these as well. I don't want you to think just because you're saved or you've called on the name of Jesus and he is now your Lord and Savior that you cannot fall into any of these traps. You most certainly can. And you will probably find if you are, are self-aware that there are seasons of your walk with God where these things, these traps had tripped you up. I mean, I'm a pastor of a church and I am constantly having to weigh this trap. I mean, people are like, can we, can we have like a dinner on that Sunday night and, and we all get together and hang out? And I'm like, the Chiefs play that Sunday night. Do I really want to be around people? Because what I've found is that when people watch Chiefs games with me, they only like to record me and put it on the internet. I know, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm thankful I haven't slipped up yet, but, and I didn't kick the dog last year, if you've seen the video, I didn't kick the dog. Each excuse is different, but yet they are all the same. It's a priority issue. We have other things to see first. I have other things to do first. I have to tend to these things first. And Jesus in this parable is, is laying out a, a very simplistic point, which is this. If God is not first, your table will not be there. Your spot at that table will not be there. He has to be first in your life. You're like, what does that look like? Time out. We'll get into that. We cannot let pride creep in and think that we're above these things. Because we're not. They will trip us up. And if they do, praise God for the grace of God. Amen? Yeah. He restores. He gives back. He does not, he does not condemn. Uh, Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who follow Jesus. Condemnation is a voice of the enemy. It is not the voice of God. So when you mess up, the voice of God is, I love you. I'm here for you. I restore you. The voice of the enemy is, Oh, man, you're never going to learn. You're just, you're wretched. You're horrible. That's, that's, not, that's not God. And if anyone says that to you, just know they are not speaking for God. Okay? We need to make the Great Commission our number one priority. What is the Great Commission? I'm glad you asked. Mark 16 says this. In verse 15 it says, Then Jesus said to them, 
Go, everyone say go. go, into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That simply means to every single person you come across, you should be preaching the gospel. And I'm not talking with a megaphone or a sign or a t-shirt. Or I'm, I'm saying your life should be the megaphone that speaks for Jesus. Long before you ever open, a, open your mouth to tell them that you follow Jesus, they should see by our lives that we follow Jesus. Yeah. Verse 16 says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Everyone loves to talk about that one. They will pick up snakes and if they drink, or should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. I feel like I need to touch on a few of these so people don't walk out of here and have some different idea of what kind of church you attend, okay? First of all, just because we can handle snakes and possibly get bit and we will not die, quote unquote, because we obviously have protection from God, doesn't mean that we just go handle snakes, no. Right? Snakes are evil. I don't like them. I don't want anything to do with them. I know, I know, I know. I would much rather a snake than a spider, though. I feel like snakes are a little bit more predictable. You don't know which spiders jump. True story. When we lived in Florida, my friend came in to get me at like two in the morning. Bro, you awake? Yeah? Can you come out here? Yeah. So I come out in my, in my boxers, nothing else on, and he's in his, and he's like, over there. I don't know why we were whispering. He's over there, like this spider had ears. I look over there, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this spider was the size of a plate. It was like this big. It was nasty, and it was in the corner of the wall. You know, the place you can't really get. So what do we do? Two grown men in their boxers, middle of the night. I grab a broom and he grabs a, like some yardstick or something. I don't even know what it was. I'm creeping up to this thing and I smack it and it falls and hits the desk like, like that. And then <laughs> runs off. Listen. I looked at him, he looked at me, we were in agreement without ever saying anything, we are not going to sleep until this thing's dead. Long story short, I pick up the desk and I move it and we can't find it. Nope, can't find it. And then I had this thought, I was like, there's a lip on that desk, on the backside, what if? So I poke my head around and that thing is right there on the under part where my hand was. Boy, I drop kicked that desk in a heartbeat. That thing fell on the ground and we just, oh, that, that thing was dead a thousand times. What does that story have to do with my message? Absolutely nothing. It's just a great story. But we don't handle snakes just because it says we can. Am I clear? We don't go out and just find people that we think are demon possessed and cast demons out of them. It's not how this thing works. Oh, you're a Broncos fan? Come here. No. Oh, you like the Packers? Come here. No, we don't do that. That's not what we do. It says we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I don't know about you, but you should do this. If you have sickness in your body or your child is sick, you should lay hands on them and you should pray in the name of Jesus and tell that thing to go because everything bows at the name of Jesus. Now, if it doesn't go, God is still good, amen? And if it does, praise God, we're going to have a praise party. But that's what Scripture teaches, and we have to walk with boldness and faith in that, com in that confidence that Scripture gives us of who we are in Christ, amen? Now, this is the Great Commission. This is what we are called as Christians to be all about. You can have other passions in life, but we're talking about priorities, and this should be the number one priority on our list. Every day we should wake up with the mentality of, if I come in contact with somebody today, are they first going to see Jesus out of me? 
and are they going to hear about Jesus? And you got to answer yes on both of those, and you got to go do it. That's the way we should be living our life. When this mission, when this is our mission in life, we understand that. I got another point for you. Write this down. We don't sit. We do not sit. Notice Jesus did not say, sit and preach the gospel to all creation. And not say, hey, go to church every Sunday, sit down, encourage one another, and then go about your week acting like you never even know me. You never even knew me. Like, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying sit and preach. He says, go, go preach the gospel. Let it be everything you're about. Let it be the very thing that you think about, that you act upon. Let it be the number one priority in your life. We cannot think that just sitting in a seat every single week on a Sunday and hearing a good message and, and leaving church and going, man, I feel really good about life. That was really encouraging today. Man, he was on fire. I, goosebumps, hair was raised. It was awesome. I even teared up a little bit. And then think that that's what God is looking for and that that's going to be the thing that carries you throughout the week. Because if you are simply leaning on this little dose of sugar every Sunday, it is not going to sustain your spiritual appetite throughout the week. This is not what God has called us to be. This is not what God had in mind when he sent the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of every single one of us who call in the name of Jesus, that we would just get together one day every seven days, sit together, sing a few songs, raise our hands, look at some people, judge some others for wearing something, and then walk out and go about our life and then come back and do it again. That is not what God had in mind when he designed this whole thing. He wants his people, I, mean, I, I didn't give you my title, I'll give it to you. This is the title of the message, Making Moves and Making Room. Making Moves and Making Room. He wants his people to make moves. How many of y'all like being around people who make moves? If you don't know what I mean, these are people that are, that are constantly in movement. These are people who are constantly getting things done, whether it be work around the house or they got a second job or a third job or they started their third company or, 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 or they've got some side, of side hustle going on. These are people that are constantly in movement, making moves. Everyone say making moves. God wants us as Christians to be making moves. He wants you to start that business. He wants you to start giving. He wants you to, to start that side hustle. He wants you to get involved and keep moving. But so many of us are so content with just sitting and thinking that God's just gonna dump everything in your lap. God wants you to make moves. Why? Because it's in the making moves that you can interact with people that you can be amongst people who don't believe like you. So you can be amongst people who don't look like you. So that you can begin to be a walking billboard for Jesus. So when you start that company and you have an opportunity to cut a corner to make some money, you choose not to cut the corner in order to do the right thing. Although you may lose out on money you do not lose out on an on, 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 on impact for somebody's eternity. Because you're making moves with one priority, and that is, I'm going to tell people and show people who this Jesus is that's changed my life. That he wasn't just a historical figure who walked amongst people. That he wasn't just somebody who did a few good things and then died. But no, that he is the God who came down to this earth to live a perfect and sinless life for you and me so we wouldn't have to. And he would die on a cross, which we deserved. And he would be ripped open and beaten. And he would be buried in a tomb and resurrected three days later, victorious over death, hell, and the grave for you and for me. And now our mission is to go tell everybody about what he did for us. We are not called to sit at church every Sunday and then do nothing with it. We are called to make moves so we can make Jesus known. We can't sit here and be okay with the fact that every single day people are dying without knowing Jesus and spending eternity away from him. I want to be very clear where we stand on this topic. Hell is very real. Heaven is very real. 
You don't believe me? I'm, I've been talking to the team, maybe we should do a series just on hell, like where we just talk about hell for four weeks. And we can learn what scripture says and what Jesus has to say specifically about this place that was not designed for, for people, for me and you. It's not what it was designed for. It was designed with one purpose. When Lucifer, Satan, decided he wanted to rebel against God and he wanted to be God, he says, well, if he can do it, I can do it. He got a third of the angels to rebel as well, and they were all kicked out of heaven. I mean, before Harrison Butker was a thing, Jesus was punting. He was punting people right out of heaven. Pew. Bam. Maybe that was the asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs. I don't know. Just a theory. Don't quote me. It's not, it's not scriptural. Just saying. Just an idea. He would be very upset. And that would just mean he would, he would hate Satan even more. So, um, but it's a very real place. And it was designed for those angels, those fallen angels that rebelled against God. It was not designed for us. But then you see in Genesis, the whole thing went down. We rebelled against God. And now those who reject what Jesus has done will be the ones that ultimately spend their eternity separate. It's not the hellfire. It's not all that stuff that everyone wants to talk about that's the worst. It's the actual separation from your creator, the one who made you, that is the worst, for eternity. It's real. It's real, y'all. And we cannot be content with just living our lives, sitting in our seats, the same seats that we sit in every Sunday, and drinking our lattes, and living this nice cush life that we get here in America with AC, indoor plumbing, and grocery stores. And now people, grocery stores from the grocery, people from the grocery store now bring you the groceries to your house. Like, it's not, that's not what life is about. It's about one thing. We're on a mission. We are making moves and in order to make room, and we do not sit. Why? Why do we not sit? Because sitting only happens when the job is done, and the job is not done. And let me get all up into people's end time theology here. Some of us in here are just sitting and waiting for Jesus. He's going to come, and I'm going to be ready. Like you're, sitting at a, like you're sitting at a window like you, a little kid, waiting for your mom to get home. As if that's what God wants. Jesus made it very clear that until this gospel is preached all over this world and people get to hear it, he is not coming. This gospel needs to be preached. And there are people still in this world that have not been reached with the gospel. Then you get into, well, what if they don't? There's grace for that. But the goal for us is to tell people about who Jesus is. We got to make moves, y'all. We can't be sitting at home, Netflix and chilling all the time, thinking that's what God wants in our life. No, Netflix is great, but it shouldn't be the top priority of our lives. We should not be binge watching only TV shows. We should be binge reading the word of God and then binge living the word of God and showing other people about who he is. Everyone yell, make him moves. We got to make some moves, understanding who we are as Christians and what kingdom we truly do belong to. I know some of us right now, we all up in our fields about elections and everything like that, and we identify as Democrat, and we identify as Republican, and we identify as this, and we identify as that. Listen, before you identify with anything, you are not that. You are a child of God. Right. Long before I identify with the kingdom, the, the chief's kingdom, I identify with the kingdom of God. That's my identity, yeah. right. and that should be your identity as well. He wants us to make moves so we can show and tell people what, what Jesus is like. We got to show them that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Right. That nobody, absolutely nobody gets to the Father except through him. Do you mean to tell me? Yeah, I do. There is no other way that you can be saved. There is no other way you can know God. There is no other way you can be right with God except through Jesus. You can't do enough good works. You can't give enough money to charity. You cannot live a right enough life to, get to, to have a relationship with God. The only way you can have that is through Jesus. Don't let anybody else get you, uh, you know, all sorts of distorted 
on what your, what your view on this is because scripture tells us there's only one way. And listen, I know it can be frustrating because I've been downtown too and the one-way streets annoy me. But in this kingdom, there's only one way and that's through Jesus. Our purpose is to plunder hell and populate heaven. Plunder hell and populate heaven. In other words, we are called to go into all the dark places. We're called to go into every alley. We are called to go into every street. We are called to occupy every aspect of life for the kingdom of God. Right. You're like, oh, but I'm just an accountant. No, you, just, you an accountant for the kingdom of God. Right. Oh, I, I, I'm just a doctor. No, you're a doctor, yes, but for the kingdom of God. In other words, as an accountant, as, as an engineer, as a doctor, as a beautician, whatever the case may be, your job specifically opens you up to specific people and God has one goal in mind for you and that is to live so hard and so bright and so well for him that other people look at you and go, there's something different about you. And then you can go, let me tell you about him. His name's Jesus, he's wonderful, he's full of grace, he's full of mercy, he's full of light, he's full of love and he changed my life and he'll change yours. We gotta live bold as Paul said this, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the way of salvation for every single person that lives. We got to plunder hell and populate heaven. We got to go with a mentality. I'll close with this. We got to go with a mentality that says, I'm on mission from God. We are the servant in this story. We are the servant in this story. And that servant understood one thing, and that was this, that we live to invite. We live to invite. Acts 1, verse 7 through 8. This is Jesus talking here. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It's not your time. It's not for you to know when the end's gonna come. It's not your time to know when Jesus is coming back. It is not for you to know these things, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You are called by God and anointed by God, given the Holy Spirit for one thing and one thing only, and that is to be a witness for Jesus, to make moves and make room at the table for other people to come to know him. We do not sit, we do not wait, we go with the mentality of, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna go amongst people, why? Because I need to tell people about, about what Jesus has done in my life. You'll receive power not to shun die each other and watch each other fall out under the power of the Holy Spirit, not so you can just lay hands on one another and watch each other be healed, not just so you can go to church and think, oh my gosh, I felt so good today. No, you were given this power for one thing and one thing only, and that's to be a witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about the ones who dress up in a white button-up shirt on Saturday mornings and ruin your cartoons by knocking on your door. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you're in the grocery store, when you're at Starbucks, when you're on your job, when you're raising your kids, it's all for the kingdom of God. Not for the chapel, KC. Not for another church down the road. We are all a part of one body and that is the body of Christ. And we're all living to do the exact same thing. And that's not to populate our churches, that's to populate heaven. And we cannot sit because the job is not done. We don't live to satisfy our appetite. We live to please God and invite others into this party. Psalm 96 verse two through three says, sing to God, worship him. Shout the news of his victory from sea to sea. Take the news of his glory to the lost and the news of his wonders to one and all. So everything we do is with the thought of how can I get this gospel to the people I come in contact with? You're like, oh, does that mean we live with an ulterior motive? No, that simply means you live with one motive. That's to get people to know Jesus. An ulterior motive means you just put up a front over here and so on the backside you can come around with something else like you in a pyramid scheme. 
no, no, no. We live with one motive, and that is to love people, to get to know people, so that we can ultimately show them who Jesus is. We don't just love people so that we can get them converted and then leave them. No, 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 no. We love them and then we watch them come into a relationship with Jesus and then we do life with them. We disciple them. We show them the ways of Jesus. We live before them the ways of Jesus. Listen, you may not know how to preach the gospel, but you can serve people and you can invite people to church. Sometimes you may not have the right words to speak and you're like, well, my pastor says it better or my, my, my leader says it better. Um, can you come to church with me? Or would you wanna to come to church with me? Surveys show that 83% of all people will actually go to church if they were just simply invited. But we happen to live so much like the three who gave the excuses. And you're like, well, I can't go to church because, well, I worked late last night and I need to get some sleep and I, because I'm going to be going to work later on that afternoon and I've got to go to church. And God's like, no, no, you need to get your butt in church so that you can feed your spirit. So when you go on your job, you're full. Your, your, your tank on the inside is full with the power and the glory of God. And your focus is reshifted onto the things that are most important. And so when you do go to your job and some Somebody comes up to you and they've got an issue you can look at him and you can go oh I know the answer to this his name's Jesus oh you're hurting he's a healer oh you're going through some things he's a sustainer oh you got a broken heart he's near the broken hearted why because my God is full of grace he's full of mercy and he's full of love church we've got to live in such a way that we show the world who our God is and stop living in such a way that repels people from the kingdom of God You've got to make moves, yes, for your family. Make moves for your income. Make moves for these things. But put them in priority and understand that people are dying and they're going to hell. And we've got a job to do. And that is to preach the gospel with everything that we have. That I don't make money so I can live a better life. No, I make money so I can impact people's lives. I make money so I can funnel it into the gospel. I have a job so that I can impact people's lives. This is about people, y'all. This is about people. And if God's blessed you, you've got to do everything you can to live in such a way that you're not sitting on it, but that you're making moves so that you can make room for people at this table. This table is always open. This table is for everyone. My last point is this, we, we, we make room. As a church, we make room. We make room for the single moms that are struggling, don't know how they're gonna make ends meet. Raising a kid by themselves because something tragic happened or baby daddy decided he didn't want the responsibility. We make room. We make room for marginalized people. We make room for the majority of people. We make room for young and for old. We make room at the table because Jesus did not die for specific people. He said, he said this specifically when he walked the earth. He said, uh, I did not come for those who think they are well. I came for those who know they are broken. And I think sometimes we, we, we look at life and we say, man, I really want to tell this person about my church, but I'm not really sure if I like them. And I don't know if I could really go with seeing them a few days a week at work and then see them again on Sunday. I don't know if I can handle that. And I would just challenge you with this. If you're not comfortable with that, there's going to be a lot of people that you didn't think are going to make it to heaven. And you're going to have to spend eternity with them. And so either you shift your focus now or you shift your focus later when it's impossible to change it. You're like, oh, I hate my neighbor. They're so annoying. And you show up that day and you look over and you're like, God, you really, you made my house next to his? And God's like, yeah, I knew it was the thing that would bug you the most. 
That's how God works. Don't ever say you don't want to be a missionary. He'll call you to be a missionary, all right? God takes the things like that and he uses them. He uses them. But we've got to make room. We've got to live to fill the house of God because this table is always open. Luke 14, 21 through 24 says, so the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Notice that he did not say to him, hey, I want you to pick and choose who you're to call. No, he said, call everybody. Listen, the people, scripturally speaking, the people that he went out to first that gave the excuses, scripturally speaking, theologically speaking, Jesus is making a, a implication that it's actually the Jewish people who reject him. And now it's open to the Gentiles, to everybody else. But don't think that you can't fall into those situations either. But specifically, he did not give him any type of prerequisites. He didn't give him a list of things that he wanted people to meet. No, he said, just go out and invite everybody. Oh, they got issues? Bring them in. Oh, they broken? Bring them in. Oh, they don't, they don't know which way's up and which way's down? Bring them in. Oh, oh, they did what yesterday? Bring them in. Oh, yeah, no, they got an addiction? Bring them in. Bring them in, make moves, make moves, do what you gotta do, but make, make room and make moves and bring them in, bring them in. Everyone shout, bring them in. Bring them in. He said, master, the servant said, what you have ordered is done and there is still room. And the master told the servant, go into the highways and the hedges and make them come in so that the house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of the people that were invited before will be in my banquet. I'm here to tell you today, you are the servant and you are called to make moves and you are called to make room and you are called to understand that when you're on the highway, you're a child of God. And when you're in the hedges, you're a child of God. And when you're on the streets, you're a child of God. And when you're in the alleys, you're a child of God. When you're in your home, you're a child of God. Everything about you is that you are a child of God and you ooze and you move and you, and you, and you have your being in this thing called a child of God. You are a representative. The Bible says this, I am an ambassador for the kingdom of God. I speak on behalf of him. We have to make room in our lives for people to experience this freedom that we have found in Jesus. Listen, this is not lottery numbers. This is not some great place that you found that you don't want anyone to know about. No, this should be the thing that when we come in on Sundays and we see this room packed, we get excited. Not because somebody's sitting in our seat necessarily, but because people are coming to know this Jesus. And when you're out in the streets, if you don't have words to speak about the gospel, just invite them to church, invite them to your small group, invite them to whatever it is that you've got going on and start making an impact. Start making moves with one motive in mind and that's to tell people about Jesus. And then in this house, we always make room for everybody. We make room in our finances to support the gospel being preached. We make room in our church for people to experience Jesus. We make room on our friends list to invite and lead people who don't look like me. We make room in my day to day to invite people to church or a chapel group or whatever it is I got going on. We make moves. I don't wanna be a church, can I be honest with you? I don't wanna be a church that is just okay with existing. I don't wanna be a church that's just okay because we got a space now, we're comfortable and we got a, a place we can come to and we're not sitting on metal folding chairs anymore. People aren't bringing butt pads to church anymore. Like, I don't wanna be a church that's just content with that. Because I see this church by the leading of the Holy Spirit and for the glory of God, having multiple campuses all across Kansas City, from KCK down to Gardner, from Lawrence all the way over into Blue Springs and Lee Summit, that every part of this metropolitan area would be impacted and infiltrated by the Chapel KC, not so that we can build our kingdom and our platform, but so we can build the kingdom of God and start leading people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Church, we're gonna be making some moves. I need you to make moves with us. And make room, invite, invite, invite. They may shut you down. 17% might shut you down, but 83% will take you up on it and then follow up and lead them. Live in such a way that your one priority is the kingdom of God. Every head bowed and every eye closed. 
If you're in here today, and I want you to be honest with yourself, you ain't making moves for nothing other than yourself. Your moves are simply selfish and self-indulgent because Jesus isn't the Lord of your life. You say today, I wanna make a move towards Jesus today. And I wanna come to know this savior as not only my savior, but as my Lord. Maybe you're in here today and you say, Troy, I knew him like that one time a while back, but I made moves that led me away from him. And I wanna make moves to come back to him, my first love. I want you to know there's nothing you've ever done, there's nothing you've ever said, and there's nothing that you, you could ever do that would ever separate you from the love of God. He loves you. He just wants to be in that relationship with you again. If that's you on either of those invitations, you wanna make a move towards Jesus for the first time, or you wanna rededicate your life and make a move towards him again, every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you in today, I just want you to slip your hand up. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. I see that hand. Listen, I'm, you can put him down. I'm not gonna call you down to the front. I'm not gonna put you on blast. I'm not gonna do any of that. I just simply wanna pray a prayer. And I want you to repeat it after me, but I want you to know this. This prayer is not gonna save you. Jesus is the one who saves you. This prayer is simply just gonna give words to what you're feeling in your heart, that leading the Holy Spirit's giving you right now. If you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand, just say this prayer after me in church. If you believe in what they're doing, repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for me. I confess all my sins to you. I thank you that they are gone with no shame and no condemnation that I am free as a child of God, help me to make moves for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you, if you prayed that prayer, you raised your hand and you prayed that prayer with us, could you please, on the connect card that was in your seat or next to your seat, just mark, fill it out, mark it on there that you accepted Jesus today. If you have a prayer request, you can put it in there as well. We're not gonna track you down. We're not gonna show up at your door. We're not going to, we, we might, we're not going to send you a fruit basket. We're not going to do any of that. We just want to know who you are so we can know who it is that we're trying to do life with. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We have next steps right after this. If you want to get involved in this church or you want to know how to get involved in this church and you want to take your next step, go right downstairs, the first classroom on the left. We have some refreshments. It'll be about 15 minutes. You can leave your kids in chapel kids. It'll be about 15 minutes. There's no pressure. You can just go right there after service today and Alex will be the one to lead you. He's the one that rocks out on the base up here. Uh, he'll rock it out for you down there and uh, I'm sure I guarantee it's gonna be quick and it's gonna be such a good time. Church, can we give a hand clap for those that just gave their life to Jesus? Greatest decision they will ever make. Awesome. If this is your first time, don't forget to stop back um, by the coffee bar. Roberta's back in there, and she has a gift for you, so we want to make sure you get that. Um, also, this is the giving part of our service. If this is your first time as well, we do not want anything from you. This service is for you. This is for those who call the Chapel KC home, and there are a few ways you can give. You can give online at thechapelkc.com slash give on the app or in person. Also back by Roberta, there is a, bu a bucket, basket, bucket, um, back on the coffee bar that you can do that. So a few other announcements we have in Fuego this week. So for those of you who have youth right here on Wednesday nights, that is there. And then on your seat, when you came in, there was this little sheet. It says KVC and then has the Chapel Casey by it. This is our season three community outreach. So what we are doing for this particular season, it's close to Christmas. We are collecting funds to make sure we can buy hair care products and cosmetics and all these fun things for girls 
individuals that are aging out of the foster care system. So on this particular sheet, there is a couple different spots. One says I want to fully adopt a child. So each girl we have averaged out about around $80 for good hair care products um, and a range of products, right? So each of us are very drastically different. So we want to make sure every girl gets what they need. Um, so you can adopt, fully adopt a child. Um, or there's other part here where it says I want to donate and then it's a blank amount towards a child's need. Um, you can take this form, fill it out and put it in one of our offering envelopes or on the back there is a church of Venmo account and it has what we, um, what you can put in the, oh, what's it called? Like the memo line. And so it'll go into the proper account. And so that's for you. So grab that. Also on your way out, there was this form. This is our legacy offering. This is back on our coffee bar. So make sure to grab this so you can see um, more details on that. And it's right back also by Roberta. Basically anything you need, check back by Roberta. She's your girl today. Uh, we, if you would like another espresso as well, that'll be open for another 30 minutes. But last but not least, Pastor Troy hit on it. Next step is the place where you can find how to get connected here and find your place at the Chapel KC right after service. Literally, immediately, we're going to turn the lights on, go downstairs. Alex will be right at the bottom of the steps waiting for you. It'll be about 15 minutes. I promise you, it is absolutely great. If you would like to get plugged in, please do that. But go ahead, stand on up.